When I was a kid, I was really into nature and really into science, but there were really different things in my mind. I used to love running around the woods, catching fish, going camping with the scouts, and then in school, the science classes were always my favorite, physics, biology, chemistry, and so naturally when I went to college, plan A was become a scientist. I took all the science classes, that went well, and then uh, I got a job in a lab. And that's where I realized that maybe this wasn't for me. This sort of working in a lab all day just kind of sucked the life out of me, and I realized maybe this wasn't what I wanted to do. So I went back to college the next year looking around for plan B. What else can I do? And that's when I realized that there's a science behind nature, and that science and nature can really be, become the same thing. And this is ecology. Right? the study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. And this area of research is really important. There's so much we don't know. There's so much left to discover. And it's really important not only for conservation of the planet and the animals that live there, but also for our own human well-being because you know the air we breathe, the water we uh, drink, a lot of our food is dependent on a healthy ecology. So I decided to focus on ecology. In particular, I got really interested in movement ecology, the movement of animals because well, animals are just awesome, right? And uh, their moving around the planet is really amazing, but it's also what makes them difficult to study because they're always on the move, right? You can go out and put a piece of paper on a tree and go back and find that tree again later, but you do that with an animal, it's long gone. And movement is so important for ecology, for the health of our planet. We've got all the major ecological forces like predation, right? That's one animal moving to predate on another one. Uh, things like seed dispersal, this is how plants are moving around the planet. They're not very good at moving, right? But they can have animals help them move their seeds to new places. This is how we get things like reforestation. And then we've got disease dynamics, right? The emergence of diseases is the interaction between one species and another. And then the spread of disease uh, between individuals is also all about animals moving around and coming in contact with each other. So this is what I wanna talk about today, is how does ecology help us understand COVID-19? And in particular, how does movement ecology help? Now, one of the amazing things about studying movement ecology over the last few years is how much technology has improved and how much this has helped us study this really hard to observe phenomenon of animal movement. Uh, for example, we've got GPS units now that allow us to put a tag on an animal and see everywhere they go around the planet. And now these GPS tags are getting smaller and smaller so we can use them on smaller animals and have less of an impact on them. One of the projects I'm working on right now is called Icarus, is working on sticking a specialized tracking antenna on the International Space Station. Now, Icarus launched last year uh, and is now attached to the space station, aimed down on Earth, looking for these animal tracking tags that we're starting to put out now on smaller and smaller animals. The other technology that's really revolutionized how we do this is camera traps. These are motion sensitive cameras that we can put out in the environment, strap it to a tree, and then we can see what animals are moving in front of them. So this way, we don't have to catch an animal and put a tag on it. We can just put this sensor out in the environment and see what's going on. And we're now putting more and more cameras in more and more places, often with collaborators all across the country. So for example, last year, we did the first ever nationwide camera trap survey called Snapshot USA, where we had collaborators, including a lot of students, running cameras in all 50 states all the way across the country. So if you end up taking my class here at NC State, uh, you'll probably be setting some camera traps contributing to this nationwide uh, assessment of where the animals are going and how many animals are out there. As a result of all these new technologies, we're really starting to enter what I call the golden age of movement ecology. There's so much information, there's these big data sets that are showing exactly what these animals are doing in a way that we've never had before. So I wanna show you this example of real tracking data. These are storks coming from Europe uh, and flying south. It's fall time and these white storks are getting out of town before it gets too cold, flying over the Sahara Desert, an incredibly dangerous journey, um, and working their way into East Africa. And what's cool is, right, every time they land, they're gonna be interacting with other animals. Here's some real tracking data from wildebeest that are doing their own things out there in the savannah. And what's amazing about these storks is some of them keep going all the way down to South Africa. And of course, every time they stop, they're interacting with other species. Here's some African buffalo that are doing their thing, which are also interacting with things like um, elephants. Uh, and so this gives you an illustration of just all the constant movement that's happening. As these storks now migrate back north, it's springtime, moving back over the Sahara, up the Nile, through the Middle East, 
and back to the fertile grounds of Europe in the, uh, in the springtime. So these data show you just how much animals connect the planet. The next story I want to tell you about happens in Zambia. This is a project that I, I'm doing now, I did recently this year, and we're still studying these bats that mysteriously show up in this swamp forest in Zambia. And when I say the bats show up, this is one of the most amazing displays in nature where you have hundreds of thousands, millions, we're not really sure how many bats there are, but they completely fill this forest here. You can see they're draped all over the trees. This is sunrise. So they've just come back from their night of foraging. When they fly out in the countryside, uh, they're eating fruit. They're certainly dispersing these trees around, helping to reforest the area. And then um, they sleep during the daytime. And then at night, we had this incredible emergence at sunset where these bats are flying out and you can get a scale of just how many bats are out there by looking at this. But actually counting them is another thing. How do we count these bats? So we decided to do a project where we put these GoPros out and film them as they fly overhead. So here's the view that a GoPro gets as the bats are flying out at sunset. And you can think, okay, well maybe you can start to count these. And so you say one, two, three, four, five. Oh, this is getting a little bit tricky. But when they're really moving, when they're really flying, there's so many that they're really impossible to count. So we've collaborated with some engineers to use artificial intelligence to automatically identify these bats. All these colored dots are bats. And as they fly across this red line, they get counted. So this is what we're doing to try to count these bats and figure out how many bats are actually there. Now, of course, we also want to know where these bats are going. So we're using some of the smallest tracking tags to uh, attach to the bats and then let them go and see where they go. And this is some brand new data that we're just getting right now. Here you can see a bat that started out in Zambia and then flew north into the Congo, into the center of the heart of Africa. And we thought, okay, well, maybe this is where they go. And then after a couple of weeks, it continued up into South Sudan. And now you can see, uh, if you zoom in, it's hanging out right by this village, uh, kind of by some farmer's trees, occasionally going out to the west to some swamp forest, coming back to the tree. That's where this bat is right now, right today. I got another email today showing me the bat's there again. So this is showing you, I hope, these two examples, just how amazing this tracking data is and also how animals connect the planet, right? These animals are moving around globally on their migrations, locally on their foraging, uh, and they're playing really important ecological roles. But as we go out there and do this research, we're not just studying animal ecology, but we're also studying how humans fit, how we fit into this big picture. For example, we did a project uh, looking at what happens when humans go out into nature, out into the wild, um, by putting cameras out in parks, uh, on trails and off trails, and some trails, some areas that were hunted, some areas that were not hunted, to see what's the effect of hunting and hiking on wildlife. And as you can see from this video, the animals don't really mind the trails. In fact, some of them really like the trails. Uh, they, you know, scoot off when humans come hiking by, but they come right by. So trails had relatively little effect and hiking had relatively little effect on the wildlife. Now we did find that some of the species that are hunted, especially deer, uh, are, have smaller populations where they're hunted, um, but they still have abundant populations and it's really well-managed hunting uh, so that none of the species are endangered. Another project that we're doing is looking at well, what happens when the wild comes to us. So we work with citizen science camera trappers to put out cameras in their backyards, in the woods behind their house. And what we found is that there's actually more wildlife and a more diversity of wildlife in the suburban areas and in the lightly developed areas than there is out in the wild, in the real wilderness. There's actually more animals. They seem to be taking advantage of some of the resources that we provide them. They, of course, deer love the gardens uh, and uh, squirrels love the bird feeders. And this seems to be having a big impact. We're also looking at what happens when domestic and wild mix. So we had this cat tracker project, which is uh, based out of NC State and run by undergraduates who helped me run this, this project. What's amazing is this started locally here in Raleigh and now it's a global project with collaborators in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. We've tracked over 900 cats and we're trying to understand how far they go and what their ecological impact is. And we've got some good news and some bad news. On the bad news side, we found that house cats that go outside have a four to 10 times bigger impact on the animals that they hunt than you would expect from a native species, like a native cat of the same size. So that's the bad news. They're having a big ecological impact. 
The good news is that this is over a relatively small area because the cats really aren't moving very far. They're only going about 100 meters from their house. So the take home is that if there are endangered species that are living close to houses, and that means they're probably living close to cats, that it's really important to keep those cats indoors so they don't have a negative impact. Now, what these studies are showing is that humans are really part of the ecology of the planet, right? We're not separate. There's not nature and humans, but we're all part of the same planet and we're all interacting. Uh, and sometimes there's good things that happen and sometimes there's bad things that happen. And really COVID is showing this more than anything else in our history. They're showing that we are part of the ecology of planet Earth, right? The whole spillover of COVID from other species, right? It was a disease in other species and uh, probably wasn't really causing them any trouble. Now it's spilled over to us because of ecological interactions. And now it's spreading between humans because of our interactions with each other. So what I wanna end on is how can movement ecology help us fight COVID? Um, now we can't just stop all these interactions, right? We can't just have everyone stay inside forever. That's not gonna work. And uh, what we need to do is manage these interactions. And so this is how movement ecology really helps. We can slow the spread of the disease between people by managing human movement and by creating these models that take uh, aspects of the biology of the disease and the aspects of the movement of the people and simulate different scenarios and understand, well, what happens if we change our movement this way? How will it change the spread? And if we change it this way, how will it change the spread? And these are the models that are informing the regulations that are going out all across the country, all around the world, trying to reduce the spread. So far, it's having a big success, uh, but of course there's this uh, trade-off between reducing movement too much and having other problems uh, and slowing the spread. So this is what we're trying to do using these disease models based on movement ecology to understand the spread of uh, COVID. Now, the other thing that we can manage uh, is about preventing future spillover events, future pandemics, right? Because we have a pretty good idea that this pandemic came from the illegal wildlife trade. And this is a real disastrous thing. This illegal wildlife trade, it's terrible for the animals because it's unregulated hunting, it's poaching, uh, and it's at a really large scales so that it's uh, really bad for these species, right? A lot of these species are going extinct or disappearing from the forests because of this illegal wildlife trade. And it's also really bad for humans because they're taking all these animals, putting them into these markets where it's really unnatural interactions, right? It's, it's pangolin and bat and human and civets all together, all breathing each other's air. They're probably peeing all over each other. And these are where diseases, it's just a recipe for disaster for disease emergence. We're pretty sure this is where COVID came from. There's been other diseases that have come from this as well. And so clearly this is something we need to stop. We need to use this disastrous epidemic to motivate people to stop buying this stuff and to, to kill the illegal wildlife trade. And what's interesting is here in the United States, we actually had the same problem about a hundred years ago. We had huge wildlife markets. We had out of control hunting that was not regulated. And we had species extinctions because of this. The passenger pigeon was probably the most numerous bird in North America, maybe the world. And we drove it to extinction by over hunting. It was sold in markets uh, throughout the United States along with lots of other species. Uh, and it wasn't just the passenger pigeons. Deer were super rare. Canadian goose were super rare. All sorts of animals that we see now are common were, were driven nearly to extinction. But what happened? What did we change? Well, there has been, without a doubt, a miraculous recovery in wildlife in the United States and North America due to proper wildlife management. And this is what we study here in my program at NC State, the Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Program. We're studying how do we manage wildlife populations so that we can have sustainable hunting where we have populations that are not declining and we also have safe harvests where we're not spreading disease. Uh, and we've learned a lot about how to do that. And now we have really healthy populations uh, in the United States and North America. And hopefully we can uh, apply some of what we've learned over these years to help animal populations around the world, to uh, help their populations recover, and also to prevent future pandemics. In conclusion, I hope you've seen that from movement ecology, we've learned that animals really connect the planet. They're moving all over the place at global scales and also at small scales. And that humans are really part of this ecology. We're not separate. We're all mixed in. We are an animal moving around the planet, interacting with lots of other animals. 
We need to use this information to fight disease by managing these interactions. We need to manage our own movement to reduce the spread while still keeping our economy going. We also need to prevent future spillover events by eradicating the illegal wildlife trade around the world to prevent these unnatural interactions and also save these species from going extinct.